I've got another round of test boards back from the fab. Let's take a look and see if they're any good. Welcome back to Cloud42, I'm James. A couple of weeks ago, I showed some of the progress I was making on a new control panel for the Electronic Lead Screw project. If you haven't seen the previous videos, it's a system that uses a motor and an electronic controller to change the feeds and thread pitches on a lathe, so you don't have to mess around with change gears. I'll put up a link to the entire project playlist. You'll remember that I was working on addressing a long-standing flicker in the display, and I was waiting for some new boards to arrive from the fab. And well, the boards are back from the fab. The one thing you will notice looking at these side by side with the ones that I showed last time is that these have no copper fills. There's no ground planes on the top or the bottom, and that's because these are four layer boards. There are actually ground and power planes, but they're internal to the construction so that the only traces on the top and bottom of the board are the actual routing traces for the power for the LEDs and the signals to carry the data. The reason I did this was to try to reduce some of the sources of electromagnetic interference that I hypothesize might be causing some of the flickering issues. So James, how does making this a four layer board cut down on electromagnetic interference? Well, funny you should ask. I think the easiest way to explain it will be to look at the board layouts on the computer. These are the Gerber files for the PCBs that I showed last time. Let me turn off some of the layers that we don't need here. And this leaves just the top copper and bottom copper layers. The pink color is the top copper and the kind of pale salmon color is the bottom copper. You can see that on the bottom there is a ground plane that covers most of the board and it just has cutouts for a few traces that needed to be routed on the bottom. The key feature here that matters for this discussion is underneath the driver chip here, we have the three signal lines that are coming in from the external connector to the chip. And then we have a bunch of lines that go out from the chip to drive the various LEDs on the board. And a number of those you can see are on the bottom of the board routed up and around and they go directly under these signal lines. And this is potentially a large source of electromagnetic interference. Why is that? Well, let me see if I can explain. If you've been around Science Education YouTube, then you'll remember about a year ago when Veritasium published this video claiming that electricity does not flow through wires. And boy, let me tell you, a lot of YouTubers made a lot of money arguing about this. The thing is, he had the fundamental concept correct, that the energy carried through an electric circuit is not specifically flowing through the wires, it's flowing through the electromagnetic field between the wires. Rick Hartley gave an excellent talk at Altium Live 2019 and it is on YouTube. I'll put a link down in the video description. If you're interested in any of this, I highly recommend checking it out. But the fundamental concept that you have to keep in mind for EMI control on PC boards is the electric field that is created between a trace carrying a signal and the nearest ground plane or the return path for that signal. And he's got an illustration here. Uh, Phil's Lab also did a video on this and lo and behold, he's got Rick Hartley's images in here. There are signal integrity and EMI PCB design videos all over YouTube that talk about these concepts. But the fundamental concept is that you want to keep that electromagnetic field between a circuit and its return path as small and compact as possible. Because if you separate the signal from its return path, that electromagnetic field will expand to cover that distance. And in so expanding, that larger electromagnetic field will radiate energy. It is also susceptible to absorb energy from outside. So this is how energy escapes in the form of electromagnetic interference coming out of a circuit and affecting other things. And this is how electromagnetic energy is absorbed so that outside interference affects a circuit. Well, how does that relate to the design for this PCB? Well, in this case, we have three high impedance circuits that are carrying low current sensitive digital signals across the board. And you can see they're traveling over the top of a ground plane. So the electromagnetic field for those circuits is tightly coupled between that trace and the ground plane underneath it. But then it reaches a break in the plane and crosses over these other circuits on the bottom of the board. And in that space, 
the electrical field for that trace is no longer coupled tightly to a ground plane. It has to expand to cover the return path, which in this case is going to come all the way over here and around. So the electromagnetic field associated with the energy flowing through that circuit is going to expand. And in so doing, it becomes susceptible to interference. Well, interference from what? Well, all of these traces running underneath it are carrying the power to the LEDs. And those are multiplexed signals. So the LED segments are being pulsed rapidly by this circuit, which means we have a whole bunch of high current square wave edges that have high frequency content. Now the frequency of these signals is not necessarily very high, but because they're square waves, they have sharp edges, so there's high frequency content, and that's going to very easily couple between these high current, relatively high current driven circuits and this relatively high impedance, low current circuit that's carrying the data. And there's a lot of potential for that to cause interference. Now one way we could solve this issue would be to route these traces someplace else away from these sensitive signals so that they are being carried directly over a ground plane. On this particular board with this particular circuit and the matrix layout of the circuits from the driver, that's pretty difficult. It's much easier to just switch to a four layer board. This is the new four layer layout and you're looking here at the traces on the top of the board and you can see the internal ground plane that's on layer two. And you can see that those signals are now carried tightly coupled directly over a ground plane all the way across the board to here and then where they go over to the pull up resistors, the same thing. They're carried directly over a ground plane. This keeps the electromagnetic field for that signal tightly coupled, located directly under that trace, keeps it from expanding, and keeps it from interfering and being interfered with, receiving interference from other things on the board. Specifically, if I turn on the bottom layer here in green, these signals that are carrying the high current power to the LEDs, relatively high current, those are traveling on the bottom of the board underneath the power plane. So you have the ground plane and the power plane between these signals that could receive interference and the signals that could generate it. I'm not gonna spend a bunch of time here trying to explain the theory because quite frankly, I'm not an expert in it. I've read a couple of books. I've watched a bunch of videos. I highly recommend checking out uh, Rick Hartley's video as a starting point and uh, follow the clues from there. If you just go on YouTube and you search for PCB design for EMI and signal integrity, EMI and signal integrity are the kind of key words that will take you to a whole bunch of really excellent videos, mostly uh, speaking events like Altium Live with a lot of really great information. If we look at these four layer boards that I got back from the fab, you can see these three resistors here. These are the pull-up resistors for the incoming signals, and you'll remember in the original design, those were 10K resistors, and I replaced them with 2.2K resistors to stiffen up those signals and make them less susceptible to noise. But as somebody pointed out in the comments, there's another design element in the data sheet that I completely missed, and that is there are 100 picofarad capacitors between each of these signal lines and ground and those capacitors will slow down those signals and act as a low pass filter to remove some of the high frequency energy on those lines. And that will also help to make those lines less susceptible to interference. And again, that's something I completely missed. It's something that I want to add. So let's take these boards over to the bench and let me just bodge on some 100 picofarad capacitors. Now I would like to kind of set up a test here with the 2.2K resistors and the capacitors, leave another board without the capacitors. And then I think I'm gonna go ahead and put the 10K resistors back in on two of these, one with and one without the capacitors. So we'll have all four combinations and we can test and see what the signals look like. I'll start by taking off some of these 2.2K resistors to replace them with the 10K resistors. And I don't have any hot tweezers and You'll be happy to see that my soldering has not gotten any less entertaining than it was last time. First one off, get the second one off, and the third one vanished. And it turns out it was stuck to the back of the soldering iron, so that was easy. We'll take three more of these off, and then clean up the pads that are left behind and get them ready to put down the 10K resistors, or rather, 
put back the 10K resistors so that we have those for a test case. I switched over to a smaller tip on the iron with a bent point, and that seems to be making it a little bit easier, at least on these relatively large 0805 packages. And the next step is to put in some 603 capacitors here. And this did not go as well. These things are tiny and they are smooth and they fly out of the tweezers. I lost several before I finally got three soldered down. And for whatever reason, I just could not get these, these joints to wick. And it may have been the specific soldering tip that I used or didn't have enough flux or whatever, but I just fought and fought and fought these things and you are getting to see the condensed version here. I'm back to the chisel tip on the iron and that is working better and I eventually got these three down, eventually. And then I just used a resistor lead, a through hole resistor lead on an eighth watt resistor and connected up the ground loop around the end. I did this for two of the boards and on the other one I tried a different angle and a different small chisel tip on the iron and this actually went really well. Unfortunately, I bumped the camera and knocked it all out of focus and didn't realize it until I was done so I didn't have the opportunity to just hide it in the edit so you get to see what it's really like messing around with small components, lead free solder and limited skills. This is my test setup on this breadboard here on the bench. This is identical to the hardware that I have running in my lathe, except I've got it hooked up to a bench power supply. So let's hook up to the first board here and power it up. This one is exactly as it came from the fab with the 2.2K resistors and the four layer board. And you can see that we're getting a really nice clean signal. It's got nice square edges. You can see just a little bit of curvature on the leading edge. But in general, this is nice and clear. Let me find a single pulse here. This is one single bit width. And you can see that the rise time is pretty short and it's getting all the way up to full voltage long before the center of that pulse, which is when it would be clocked and received by the driver chip. So there should be no trouble at all with that. Let's try one of the other ones here. Let's try the one with the 10K resistors and see what the pulses look like on that. So this is as recommended by the data sheet, except without the filter capacitors. I'll throw the probe on there and take a look, and you can see that with the 10K pull-up resistor, the leading edge is a little bit more rounded. It's not rising in quite as short a time. This is still fine. It's getting to the high signal level long before it gets clocked, but it is a little bit less of a nice square edge. Let's see what happens when we add the 100 picofarad capacitors with those 10K resistors. This is what was recommended in the data sheet. And you can see that the leading edge of that pulse is significantly rounded because the 10K resistor isn't providing enough current to charge that capacitor quickly. So we're not getting to full voltage until about halfway through the pulse. You put this on a long cable with even more capacitance and that's gonna start to interfere with being able to receive the signal properly. So finally, let's try the combination here with the 2.2K resistors and the filter caps. And that actually looks pretty good. That looks square enough to me. Here's a single pulse. You can see it's reaching the maximum signal level long before the center of the pulse where it would be clocked. So I think this is really the combination that I want to test on the lathe. So this is the 2.2K resistor as I got these boards from the fab four layer board with the 100 picofarad filter caps. Let's break these up and go put one on the lathe and see how it works. Pull this board off of the lathe again. Pull the four screws, pop the panel, pull the connector, and let's take it over to the bench and put in one of the new boards. Now these are just V-groove panelized, so they just snap apart. Leaves a pretty clean edge. Just take out the four screws and it should be just a simple matter of swapping out the PCB. Everything should be completely compatible. Drop right in, put the nuts back on, tighten the screws and we can take this back over to the lathe.
as you can imagine, I have put these together and taken them apart many, many times, and I've tried a lot of different tools, and I've decided that pliers are for chumps. These nut drivers work really well for holding these little lock nuts for putting it together, and I've been playing around with a little electric screwdriver, and so far I think I like it. I don't know if this is the best one. I just grabbed a cheap one off of Amazon, and it's been working pretty well for me. Just going to put this back on the lathe. Back at the lathe, we'll plug this board in one more time. We'll put the screws back in the box one more time, and we'll test it one more time. Power it up here and start up the spindle. In previous test runs, we've seen some flickering and some interference between the VFD and the display, and I'm hoping that we've got that pretty much solved now. So I'm going to run this through its paces. We'll run it forward, backwards, different speeds. I'll set up different feeds and threads. So we're running the servo at different ratios with the spindle and just try to run it through all of the different combinations and kind of timing situations I can think of to try to reproduce the flicker that we've seen with previous versions of this board. Now, no matter how much noise filtering I try to put on the board itself, it is always going to be possible with a high power, high frequency system like a VFD on a three phase motor to generate enough noise to overwhelm the electronics. There's really no way to prevent against that entirely. So this filtering is not a substitute for good wiring practices. You still need to have toroids on the VFD leads, use shielded cable for the VFD leads if practical, or if you can't solve the noise problems in other ways, you need to keep the high power feeds to the motor and the servo away from the low power electronics. You need to make sure you're not connecting the electronics ground to the ground for the servo power supply, for example. But if you do all of that, this seems to be working. I'm not seeing any flickering, so I think we're going to be good here. So it's back to the fab one more time. I have updated the schematic here. You can see here are the 2.2K pull-up resistors, and here are those 100 picofarad filter capacitors. I've added those to the PCB layout. It's easier to see in a 3D view. So we've got our pull-up resistors right here, and I added those filter capacitors right there next to the chip. Now, this is something else that I decided to add. This is a TVS diode package to protect against electrostatic damage. One of the things that I have seen on a number of boards previously is that they work fine initially. I test them all, they work great. And then eventually after people install them, sometimes right away, sometimes later, they fail. And my suspicion is that we're seeing electrostatic damage to the driver circuit. So what a TVS diode does is it provides protection from those high voltage spikes. In this case, this is a single package with a single TVS diode across the power rail. So if the power rail gets energy applied to it in excess of the breakdown voltage of this diode, it gets shorted out and it prevents that energy from going into the chip and damaging it. And then this particular chip can also connect to up to four data lines and it has clamping diodes that will clamp any electrostatic discharge coming in on those pins to the power rails, which then would dissipate through the TVS diode. So this is something I'd been planning to do all along and I completely forgot about it. And then when I realized I was going to be going back to the fab again, I went ahead and added it. So that little chip is located right here between the input pins and the circuitry. And this is just a few pennies. It seems like it's good insurance and it will help prevent electrostatic damage. Now, when you're handling this, if you're touching the components and the traces or even just having the electric field from your charged body, you can still damage it. But once it's actually installed and enclosed and wired up so that you can't touch the board, it's still susceptible to damage coming in over the cable. Like when you're trying to connect it and you feel a little shock this should help prevent that from damaging the circuit. So by the time you see this, I've already got these boards sent off to the fab and they should be back soon. And hopefully this will be the final design. Of course, need to do some testing. I made changes to the board. I'm gonna test to make sure they actually work. And that'll be coming up sometime soon. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up. Feel free to subscribe and maybe think about supporting the channel over on Patreon.
Patrons get access to downloadable files for all of my projects, and if you're already a patron, thank you. You make it possible for me to do this. Thank you for watching.